is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Here we are in the Not Sam studio with a person who at one point I felt like I was seeing quite often, but we just realized I haven't seen in since April of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, at one point you knew him as Tom Phillips, but now the world knows him as Tom Hannafin. Welcome, Tom. Hi, everybody. It really has been a long time that mm -hmm. we actually saw each other in person, which I was flabbergasted to learn about. Well, yeah, I mean, and I guess that's kind of the thing about this whole thing is that you don't realize, like, time passes, and then it doesn't, like, I think so many people that you travel with at one point, like, a year and a half goes by, and then you see them again, and you're like, I just saw you, right? Yeah, and especially because, like, it's the pandemic mentality, and that I thought we were all past that point. Like, you remember early in the pandemic, we were like, I haven't seen so-and-so in six months, and I haven't seen a family member in eight months, and it's just, it felt tragic. Yeah. And we almost felt this past summer we were past all that, and then to still discover there are stones to be turned over, I was like, oh, my God. So you and I hadn't seen each other since we were calling one episode of NXT from the studio in Stamford together in April 20, or March 2020, I guess, we is when we called it. Yeah, the very end of March. Move forward a little bit. I don't want you off camera. All right. Um, The very end of March... It was, I think it aired on April 1st, and it was one of those things where, I don't know, a couple of days before, it was just a phone call that was like, hey, you heard about this pandemic? Yup. We don't know uh, <laughs> what we're going to do here, but we need some uh, commentary, and you're close to Stanford. Do you want to come? And that's when things were still scary, yeah. right? So it was like wearing gloves mm -hmm. still, and like everything was like wipes and wipes and wipes. Masks, all the... Um uh, the the pop mics were in little baggies. They always yeah. they do that anyway, but they were doing like double baggies. Like everything was just completely locked down, and they were doing a good job. But the country, the nation, the planet didn't know what was happening or how to handle it. So we were just like, "I'm about two hours from Stanford. You're less than that." So it was 15 like fifteen minutes. Yeah. Right. So they just were like, "You two are locals." So I was like, "Great, let's go do it." Yeah. And um, I don't think it was a good commentary outing for us. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't. <laughs> You know, I it was what it was, right? I mean... We weren't even on camera, obviously. There's just a lower third that's a Tom Phillips and Sam Roberts. Right, with no explanation as to why this team is here. And it was a one-off. It it literally never happened again. No, it did not. No. No, that which is... Is that where you got the idea from, that it wasn't that good? That usually if it's good, it happens tw two or more times? You'd think. Yeah. You'd think. Why do you think you ruined it, and why was it your fault? Well, I mean... <laughs> I'll put it this way. Like, I was thinking about partners that I've had, and I was, I don't know, I don't know, my ex-partner was Pat McAfee. He's doing awesome. Fine. Doing fine. Jimmy Smith, he's doing awesome. Yep. Mackenzie Mitchell's doing awesome. Doing great. I'm going through all the... Charlie uh, Arnold. Char Charlie, yeah, yeah. She's doing awesome. Doing great. ESPN. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't me. It's entirely possible. <laughs> you're the one still working for the company, so you're clearly doing something right. I think they just don't know that. So please, if we could kayfade that a little bit. It's like office I... space. There's a glitch to be fixed. So they haven't found it yet. Yeah, yeah. Just say, I did, but that's also been my strategy, as I think that you know always, which is like, what does Sam do here? I don't know. We just, I mean, we get along fine with him. He seems like a nice guy. We, why throw him out? Right. I'll never forget when you really got an entire building. I forget where we were. Uh, got an entire building to hate you because of your take on Bianca Belair. And from then I on, we that. realized, oh, people want to hate Sam. Yeah. People, it was so valuable. You know, I feel like people who know me are like, oh, yeah, Sam's a good guy. And people who right. don't know me are like, Sam is clearly not a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's an ulterior motive there, but yeah, it was what, uh, Bianca and um, Shayna maybe in Phoenix? Yeah, that sounds about would that right. Be right. It would yeah. have been, uh, yeah, it was the takeover in 2019 before the Royal Rumble, so it was January 2019. Oh, so that was, yeah, I think that was Phoenix. So Phoenix makes sense. And then oddly enough, you go from heel analyst to you're you're the host still, right? I don't now watch I'm, any of it. No, so. <laughs> why not? Now I'm the, now, yeah, 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 yeah. So now it's like, yeah, which again was just like, uh, hey, we were looking for a host, and then we were like, Sam is a host for a living. Why don't you just have Sam host? And I was right. like, okay. 
And then that's how that happened. Do you still like go heal on people? Or? A little bit, a little bit. I caught him in the in the performance center on the last uh, NXT pre-show. I, I uh, or or kickoff show. Yeah, I, I caught him with a uh, with a take where it was like they weren't there to boo me, and then I was like, ah, I gotcha. <laughs> I, was I like, still own you. Yeah, right Have here. Have you noticed this? And you could you could feel like the audience like they're in the in the performance center, and they were like they were like, uh, uh, uh. boo. <laughs> there's nothing better yeah and I, was oh, like, it's the best. I was like yeah it's very very satisfying but uh i'll tell you yeah, this is what i was thinking about uh with you and speaking of nxt there was a period of time when you were not only a, a commentator but you took on a position in management and the thing that i find so wild about wrestling is that like for instance michael cole's in management yes Michael Cole's name is not Michael Cole. Yes. In a management off-air position, mm -hmm. he is Michael Cole. Mm -hmm. Your name, as we have all found out very recently, is not Tom Phillips. Yes. It is Tom Hannafin. Surprising a lot of people. I've seen it on the TV. I've seen it on <laughs> Fight. I watched Hard to Kill. They said, that's Tom Hannafin. I said, huh? Because even in a managerial position, in a, in a position where you're kind of leading the announced team off the air, mm -hmm. it was like, you'll report to... Tom Phillips. Right. Which is not a real person. Right. So 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 this is like what does it, is it a weird thing identity-wise when it's like it's one thing to have a stage name on television that's the thing a lot of people sure. do. But when it goes like no 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 no. This is your professional identity. I mean, I guess when an actor changes their actor I'm not talking about a character. Mm -hmm. But like let's say George Clooney was born George Humpernickel, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Which I think he was. He would probably change his name to George Clooney and then just go by George Clooney everywhere. So yeah. maybe it's like that. But is there a thing where it's like, or or does it just become so normalized that the fact that you have people that report to you that are calling you by the last name Phillips, it's just I've been on Tom Phillips on the air for so long, this feels normal. You just get used to it. And then even still, you know, so many people in wrestling where they'll have a name in one company and a name in another company and a name on the indies and then mm -hmm. their legal name. I know some people that I call by four different names at any given time. That is true. That's a good point. Like they're like, like Corey Graves, there are people who call him Sterling. I I'm call like, him Matt. Right. And, and then, I'm like, I don't know who you're talking right, about. So, I call him Corey Graves. Yeah. And Graves more often than not, but <laughs> yeah. like still like, no, that's just Matt. You right. Know? So right. Um, yeah, it's been weird. And then especially because Phillips is such an easy, easy name to digest, which mm -hmm. was the purpose of them having that intellectual property. Hannafin, as it's written, is very easy to mess up. I've had mail sent to my house that's been incorrect for years and not actually made <laughs> to my house because of misspellings because it's a funny Irish last name. So it's yeah. just, it doesn't even get pronounced like it looks. So that, it's a challenge. That's true. When you say your name's Tom Hannafin, I'm like, mm -mm. No, <laughs> no. I'm going to go Phillips. <laughs> no. I think it's Phillips. It's just simpler. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I think X Pac was on the show and he was like, hey, by the way, Sam, what do you call me? And I was like, <laughs> he was like, Sean? And I go, eh, X-Pac. Oh, and even, like, you mentioned Cole. I'm like, I can't call him Sean. It's Cole. Is it, and it's all, and it's because that's his last name. Cole. Yeah, Michael Cole. That's, that's his name. That's it. I, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't undo it. Yeah, it really is an interesting thing. So then when, when you go into a professional setting now, and you show up at Hard to Kill, and you're Impact's new play-by-play -play man, and it's like... Mm -hmm. I would like to be publicly known as Tom Hannafin. Is mm -hmm. that like, oh, you guys weren't supposed to know my secret. That's my name. That's my, I, is it I weird? Fans on social media were like that because people are convinced, like, it's such an easy name. Phillips is like, oh, that's got to be right. who he is, whatever. Um, the funny part was being backstage because, like, a handful of people would just call me Phillips. So, like, <laughs> seeing uh, W. Morrissey, uh, Matthew Raywald, uh there Which again, by the way, both right. those I'm names. Even I'm trying, like, I'm just, I'm even it. sitting here trying to be like, how do I remember what, all this stuff? Yeah. And uh, I'm even, them even being like, what are you doing here? And like, Phillips, what's up? You know, and it's just like, oh, okay. And then you're on camera calling yourself this not real name for almost nine years. Were there people who like the same way you were just like, I don't know what you're doing at NXT. Like, tell me. Were there people going like, aren't you on Raw? What are you doing here? Right. Like they, because they're not, probably not watching either. Right? Everybody thought I was dead. Yeah. You know, so I was like, hey, what's going on? Yeah. No, it's just been it's been an adjustment for a number of ways. The funniest thing, man, was this past taping. We just did one in uh, in Fort Lauderdale. So all those shows are going to start rolling out. No Surrender is February 19th in New Orleans. And uh, I was calling a match, and mm -hmm. I kept saying uh, Superstar. 
and I, I'm getting a, in my ear, they're like, you don't have to say that, you know, like you don't have to say competitor, performer, mm -hmm. um, you know, superstar, like you can say wrestler and it's not even like, and they're like, it's, it's fine. We promise, you know, <laughs> but I don't want to, <laughs> it's just, it's just muscle memory at this point. So it's breaking some habits that I no longer have to adhere to. And it's discovering, okay, Tom Phillips was a, not an actually like this big character, but like a character on a TV show. It's like, who am I now as a performer and a broadcaster? So right. It's it's a brave new world. Is it, it? Yeah. And is it interesting as a broadcaster too? Because like you're, it's one thing to be like kind of in the wrestling world. You go to WWE, you do the WWE thing, and then you leave WWE, you go kind of go back into the wrestling world and you figure it out because it's two different things. Mm -hmm. But for you, who's like this young little 23 year old something that's plucked out and it's like now you're a wrestling announcer mm -hmm. and you learn wwe and that's kind of what you learn to then go oh okay now i'm 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 just gonna be a wrestling announcer it's a different thing is that kind of i don't know if strange is the right word but is no, that it, interesting for you it is strange and first of all i do not look at myself as just a wrestling announcer. I feel like, and I know that I can do anything because I've gone out there and I've put it on tape in a variety of capacities. And I've shown that to a number of different places. And it's just a matter of garnering interest in those different spaces, so to speak. But, um, I care deep. You can't carry me through an episode of NXT. I can't get you through it. <laughs> you know, that, that I was really disappointed about, but, uh, yeah, man, it's just being able to show that I can do a variety of different things. And wrestling is part of my life in a really cool way in that, like I've mentioned it before, like people like yourself, uh, Rosenberg, Kaz, wrestling is part of your portfolio or it's part of your life and it's a passion that you pursue. Yeah. But you care about umpteen other things. You don't constantly talk about wrestling when it's you and Jim. So no. you have a lot of options of things you want to dive into. And that's what I have now. So it's like, OK, we're in the infancy of that and starting to explore. OK, I care about Penn State football. I have a podcast about it. I would like to get more into the video game space. We're pursuing that. Uh, conventional sports, conventional entertainment, all those things. I'm going down those avenues. And I think all the things that I have taken away from WWE and pro wrestling, what you're asked to do, and you know it, it's it, it's one of one. So mm -hmm. having those skills to translate someplace else, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah. And you get to... I think it's a fun thing when you get to a place in your career, even if you've kind of only done one thing, like, you know, I've been at Sirius my entire professional life. You know, I mean, it was XM first, obviously, but like Sirius XM has been where I've been my entire professional life. And sometimes you don't really realize the skill set that you've picked up mm -hmm. until you kind of take a second to assess and go like, wait, I'm not the same person I was when I got here. Right. For you, it's like, it's nine years later. I was a kid. Right. Like you're now this person right. with a full bodied skill set that mm -hmm. is not gray this, hair and everything. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Lots of it. That is not, <laughs> <laughs> not this, but it, you're not like going to the next thing to learn how to do it from scratch. It, it, you like, know? Yes. And no, like there, there are those base things that we understand in terms of like just how to be on camera and how to be a broadcast professional. I'm uh, working on it. You're, myself. you're very good at it. Oh. So, uh, I learned a lot from you over the years, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> but it, it is also learning. It's like, okay, this is the way that they execute their product. And it's just a matter of whoever they is going to be. It's just a matter of getting adjusted to that. I got a message the other day to uh, pursue something I'm going to have a call about next week that I had never thought about doing in a million years. And mm. I was like, oh, cool. All right. Well, let's have the conversation at least. And if I stink at it i stink at it if it works out then it works out yeah but it's this cool freedom now i understood the way wwe does things and they need to have their people available 24 7 that's just the way their schedule runs so now it's just completely different it's just wide open more like a freelance thing where it's like on this day i'm working for this company doing this and the next day i might be doing something else. well how many people do you know that like live and die by the non-exclusive contract that right. seems to be just dominating sports and entertainment now so it's like all right i'm diving right in yeah no i think and, it, and there is i mean it's less secure yeah it's different though but it's fun oh, oh yeah you know what i mean and yeah. it's like and it keeps things fresh and it feels like i would imagine it feels like kind of the world opens up i'm sure there's a culture shock at first but once you kind of process everything that's happened i would also imagine that you go like oh everything is a possibility it's not just about this thing is gone now everything else is here yeah it's it's just opened things up like i get to 
I, I hopped on an ABC affiliate and I did a, a you know thir- three minute bit about the Eagles before they got smoked by the Buccaneers. And I was like, oh, cool. Like I can go on there and talk about my favorite team and I can talk about Penn State football and I can jump on a couple of different podcasts like this and just enjoy my friends, really, mm-hmm. you know, like just getting to chat with people I like talking to. And it's just um, I got to do something over the summer with Kaz on CBS. And yeah, I remember we just talked for four hours. I text you afterward. I was like, this is your whole job. And you're like, yeah, it's the best. It's awesome. I was like, this seems great. <laughs> so it's just you just got to sucker somebody into paying you for it. It's <laughs> yeah, like... That's the goal. So it's just I don't know, man. It's just it, like you said, everything's wide open right now. So it's just kind of discovering what I feel like doing. Yeah, it's great. How far into WWE did you feel like? Okay, I've I've at least got my head around this thing because I'm sure at first it was like I don't this is insane like I don't know what this is mm-hmm. I'm a kid mm-hmm. like I've never done anything like this before I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to learn and I I mean correct me if I'm wrong but you were brought in to learn correct oh 100 percent right yeah yeah because yeah. I came in and I was literally a year out of college mm-hmm. less than that and got brought into the studio and you and I have had the conversation at this very desk about that but it's just. I got brought in to learn, and that's exactly what I was doing, backstage interviews, um, stuff in the studio with Renee, and then slowly learning play-by-play. And it's kind of having to remind myself now, it's like, yeah, it's going to be a different space, but it's going to be taking those baby steps, and that's fine. But I just have a different skill set now going into those first steps. So it it, it was kind of a, it was a long path to that. But to answer your question, I'm like, I didn't really feel like I had command's a strong word but that i that i had command of a broadcast mm-hmm. until my last run on raw began mm. wow i mean so that's i mean that's eight years into a nine-year run and i was told when i walked in because cole had been told this when he was hired initially by kevin dunn was that it's going to take you 10 years to get comfortable so i was like that's probably about I'm right not, I, I by no means was i like oh i was perfect or anything i was like no i had a ton still to work on but i was like eight years in i was like I'm starting to feel like I've got some modicum of control when I'm yeah. doing these shows and I felt more and more at ease and comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that goes back to like uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule, mm-hmm. you know, that like you do Seriously. to become an expert at something have to just put that time in and it almost has to become a muscle memory, right? Yeah. Cause like, even if you watch WWE and how many people do we see on the internet or you know even professionals who are like, I can do that. It's like, man, unless you've done, you know, you committed the years that like Vic Joseph has committed that Andy Shepard has done on NXT UK. And of course, Michael Cole, unless you've committed those years in that system, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I remember when I first did commentary, uh, on an independent level for Jersey, all pro wrestling, the moment, and obviously there's nobody like talking into my headset or anything. Mm -hmm. It's literally, you know, two guys with a mic plugged into a camcorder, but, but it was still, I mean, I loved it. It was some of the most fun ever. I was a kid. Like it was great. It was awesome. But there was this moment where, like, I thought I was ready. I've been watching wrestling forever. I'm like, cool. I'll just talk about the wrestling. And, like, I remember getting my first thought out. It wasn't even, it was the first thought in the first match. And I get my first thought out and I go, okay, I did it. And then I went, holy shit, I have to do this for the whole show. I have to keep coming up with thoughts. Like, I went into this panic, like, how do I do this all night now? I did, mm-hmm. I, like, I wanted to pat myself on the back for one sentence. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's and really it's like, weird. And then you, and, and you're looking around and you're like, you realize that you do. I mean, command is the right word because there's this pressure, right? Like, clearly the show's not about you. No. But there is this pressure to not make the, to make the people who the show is about look good mm-hmm. and look better. And it's like, the last thing you want is somebody in the ring busting their ass and then the reviews are that the commentary like, suck. Yeah. And, and it's like, that's why I was risking my life. Right. So that you could suck on commentary. And it's a lot of pressure. And that's happened to me before where I was like, oh, and you don't mean for that to happen. Of course. Uh, <laughs> You'd I, be a psychopath. Uh, no, be I, like, ah, I'm going to suck. It's, I just, you know, this is, I'm just going to tank this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, there were so many uh, instances like uh, Cole and JBL especially would be like, people weren't meant to talk consecutively and make no mistakes. Like the fact that that's a profession is remarkable. Mm-hmm. You're going to make mistakes as you talk. You're not going to form perfect sentence grammatic uh, sentences grammatically. I just did it. So it's like <laughs> you just keep going, and yeah. that's the thing. And you don't let it phase you. And it took me again from 23 years old to 32 to be like, okay, the the emotional maturity and the mental maturity to be like, just keep going, just pick it up, and keep moving on. Yeah. At 23, did you want to be like, I mean, a wonderkind? 
Like, did you want to show up and be like, you know what? They say it's going to take a while, but I'm going to be this 23 year old that they're going to realize it's just oh, so I absolutely awesome. that was I absolutely thought that was the case. A hundred percent. And then Every when time, I, right? And then when I got that first opportunity on uh, SmackDown, I think I was 24, 25. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like even before that on NXT, I was like, I just do not know what to do, what to say, how to how to even basically use my voice. Right. Which like it's like, like it's, a, it's a tool and you don't realize that. No, like I have a I, I have a very deep voice. I have since like grade school. So it's like, how do you not know how to use your voice? I was like, no, I was using like I was going way too high in my register or something like that. Not that high, but uh, <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> you know, um, it's just things as basic as that. And yeah. I don't know, man. It was there were a lot of complications along the way that I was just like, all right, you know, I had to get out of my own way. I was naive. I was a kid. I thought all that stuff. I was going to get brought in immediately. Pff, we're going to put you right into whatever. And I'm glad they didn't do that. So that yeah. would have been really bad. <laughs> I'd have been out faster. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have been able to build this uh, wealth of experience because they'd be like, no, you definitely are not as good as you think you yeah, are. You're yeah. a kid. And I got those uh, those reminders every once in a while, and I needed them. You I, do need them. People want to like. I don't know. I remember telling my parents over and over again, thank you for telling me the things I didn't want to hear. And you need those people in your life, whether they're family or friends, professional, personal, whatever. You need those moments and those people in your life to keep you on track because otherwise it, it'll go off the rails very quickly. Well, there's a big difference between people who you trust. They give you bad news and people who you know have not great motives. Like there are mm. people who are assholes that are just like, well, I don't really don't need to take their advice, but there are people that you can trust that still will hopefully tell you you suck when you suck. Hopefully. And then you'll get better. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Or they'll be like, you still suck. Yeah. And you'll be like, well, that's a real bummer, yeah. man. <laughs> what, what's the, the old adage? You got to suck before you're any good. You know, <laughs> it's, it's the truth. It's yeah. It's the truth. So did your parents oh, yeah, tell you that no, you suck? No, I'm kidding. Um, no, God bless them. So like I was... Oh, gosh, I moved from Pennsylvania to Connecticut when I was 12. So finished sixth grade by yourself, by myself. That's I mean, amazing. Stick and bindle and, and just <laughs> locked it. And I uh, went from like Catholic school to public school. So a big transition. Oh, wow. And then when I got to uh, high school in Connecticut, I had a chance to. What um, part of Connecticut? Avon, Connecticut. Okay. So I had a chance to do PA announcing. Um, I think it was my sophomore year. Because I had an injury. I got hurt all the time playing football. So I did the PA announcing with a friend of mine. And we were terrible. Because we thought it was like laughing or something like that. We were trying to make jokes. Of course. And then, take like, advantage of that mic time, right? The field is here. And then the practice field is over here. So the varsity team is over here. My head coach is here. And then it's like the freshman team. We're doing the PA announcement for it. The box is here. And we're saying all this stuff that is definitely making it over here to the point that I can see the coach every once in a while turn and be like, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> and I and I saw him afterwards and he was like, you know, uh, a really good broadcaster. I don't sit there and be like, what's this guy's name? And I was like, <laughs> and it's kind of what you're saying before. It was like, you don't want this to be about you. And I was like, I did that. But I also walked away from it being like, God, that was fun. You know, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I knew I enjoyed the the medium and the experience. And it was just like, OK, how do I refine this? How do I get better at this? Yeah, because doing it well is like it's not as sexy at first. It's not like as like what if I'm just ridiculous, I can have the time of my life. But yeah. when you actually do it well. And you know you've done it well. It's cool. It feels so much better. We all want to be Bob Euchre, Harry Doyle in Major League. We all want to do that. And that is my... Yeah, everyone thinks they're Bobby the Brain. No, don't worry. I'll come up with all these jokes. Don't worry about me. I got this. I, I, <laughs> it, that's what makes me appreciate people like Graves so much. Right. Because it's like, you don't find wit like that, that spontaneous wit. That doesn't happen all the time. No. It, it's crazy. No. No. Especially in, in the context of of what is being done, right? Like of, of still getting this story across. And like you said, not making it about yourself. Yeah. Right. I mean, he gets chances to, because he's the heel. So it's fun when he does, in right. my opinion, uh, some people disagree with that. That's fine. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's just picking your moments, but yeah, it, to, to your question before my parents were very supportive that even that initial uh, foray, whatever you want to call it, like PA announcing, like you want to do this, go do it. Yeah. Is, was there, when you were like, I'm going to be a wrestling commentator. That never came up. Because, <laughs> like, I, I've said it before on, on this show where I was like, okay, I played the video games. I was loosely watching wrestling on TV. Right. And my parents were not cool with it. Right. You had to, you had to pretend 
You had to go to your friend's house to watch it. I had to go happened. like play the video game at my friend's house or I'd watch it in the basement, like the volume completely shut off. So when this all developed, it was like, oh, okay, well, it's a big job. It's a big company. That mm-hmm. that looks really good. So now that it's moved into a different company, um, I remember talking to my dad about it. He was like, yeah, he's like, you spent all this time working really hard on something. And it's like, this is great that you get to continue this. And the schedule's different. Right. It's lighter. So it's just... I don't know. It's just different all around. So it's it. So far, it's been a good experience. But it, yeah, and it is. But it is interesting because it is like you're making the choice. You're like, okay, I am gonna go run away with the circus. I'm gonna do this thing. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and and you don't have to. But I, right. I mean, I personally thought it was the right move. Thank you. I was like, you know, you're good at what you do. Go find a place where you could do it. Thank you. And then you Appreciate went and that. did it. And I'll tell you what I loved about uh, your uh, performance on Hard to Kill that what really struck me, and I think I told you as much, was that, like, the amount of homework that was done before that show and the amount of, like, you might as well have been calling the four TV shows that led to the pay-per-view. Like, there was no sort of, like, not that you would ask dumb questions, but I can hear when somebody's lost out there. Mm. And it happens a lot. Like, I can can hear when it's like, that. I can hear when somebody's getting carried. Mm. I can hear when someone's lost out there. I can hear when it's like, you're out of your depth, or you you don't know, like, that statement Mm -hmm. that you, and it's a statement, it's not even a question. Right. You don't know what you're talking about. No, no, it can can be really obvious. And the best thing is, like, saying something with complete and utter confidence that you know is wrong. (laughs) Did I land it? No. No. Bummer. Not even close, especially in wrestling. Because uh, wrestling fans are the most passionate people you're going to get. 100%. And, yeah. and when wrestling's done right, the investment level is so high with the fan base. So mm-hmm. so when they start smelling that the commentators are not invested the way they are, it no. doesn't work. It, like, the connection gets lost. And I felt like you were just very connected to the product. You knew who everyone was. You knew what every match was. You knew what the story going into every match was, Mm -hmm. which even I didn't know some of them. Like I don't watch impact every single week. So I was like, okay, this is, this is not like the person on commentary has a greater level of product knowledge than I do, which I would hope for. You would hope for. Yeah. That's like the, the expectation. Then also if I just come in doing no homework and I just called the show and just be like, I'm just going to call wrestling matches. I'm like, I can't, I can't make myself just do that little work. I was like, no, I I need to commit myself to this. And don't get me wrong. A myriad of people helped me get there. It was a team effort from all the people at impact. D'Lo Brown backed me up on so many things that if I had questions the week before or during the day, he and I were chatting the whole time. Um, the creative staff, Scott Demore, Josh Matthews, all of them helped me get through that. And then even just talking to the the, the wrestlers all day. I can say wrestlers. Um, <laughs> is that getting through the day of just like, hey, like, what are you doing for a, a move? Or what is your story? Like, help me out a little bit. And everybody was so nice. But I was legitimately watching TNA for a number of years and now Impact. And yeah. that I remember when Kurt Angle showed up. I remembered Samoa Joe's runs for significant periods of time and how – it was funny to see the development of the X division. And then this huge guy come in there. It's like, no, that's also the X division. It really made things different in wrestling. And I enjoyed even things as recently. I forget what year it happened, but I mentioned it before Magnus. Now, Nick Aldis, yeah, yeah, when yeah. he was world champion and they were touring a lot across the UK and he's just getting booed out of the building. I was like, I love heels. So I was like, this is really cool. I love the tag team division that TNA has had for a number of years. Motor city, machine guns, beer, money, LAX, you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah. I was like, this is fun. And it was something like at first that was as simple as like, that's a really cool name for a tag team. Like they nailed it every single time. And then I remember the origins of Decay. Mm-hmm. So then when Rosemary's coming out for Ultimate X, I was like, if you've been a fan of this, how long has Rosemary been in Tina? Eight years? Yeah, something like that. Something sure. the better part of a decade. If you've been following her and this first ever Ultimate X match for the knockout stuff comes up, it's a big deal because her beginnings were small as a part of Decay with Abyss with Crazy Steve. I was like, this is a huge moment for the character. You have to understand the entire breadth of the character. Yeah, and I think that telling those really long story arcs that just kind of form, like you can't tell, you can't plan an eight year story. But when you get eight years in or whatever it is, you realize the story that's been told. Like yeah. a story has been told and you can kind of go like, oh man, if you just reflect back on it and you, now this is so much more meaningful than it was before. How long did you, before Hard to Kill, were you aware that you were coming in? Um, I'd say mid-December, something like that. Um, and okay, so you had about a month? About a month, uh, which is 
plenty of time, and it was a matter of going back. I think I started watching everything at uh, the Turning Point event, mm -hmm. and then just kind of, all right, watching every single week and getting up to speed on what the stories were going on, and then even going back further than that. But yeah, it was just, and then just doing homework accordingly. Like that night, it was a, a triple threat for the Impact World title, and they're celebrating their 20th year of Impact, and you're talking about, oh, well, I don't watch Impact that often. Mm -hmm. It's a slept-on brand, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I and agree. it's like people are tuning in for the pay-per-view, so you get that, okay, it's a big moment, let's check it out. And for it to have been around for 20 years is phenomenal mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of wrestling. And the Impact World title's been around for 15. Right. And the first time that the title was introduced was a triple threat match. And I was like, well, wasn't that convenient storytelling that I can just weave into this? So it's just part of it's doing your homework and part of it was just being a fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and was it difficult? Like, did you have to repeat names in your head? Like, as much as Matt Cardona has done. Yes. And he has done. And I mean, I've, I've watched it. I'm, I'm, I watch Impact. I'm a big GCW fan. Like, I've watched it all. Yeah. I'm still like... Hey, what's up, Zack Ryder? <laughs> Dude, for like nine years, I called him Zack Ryder. It was the Broski, Broski boot and yeah. uh, the, the Rough Rider. And yeah. then I saw him walking into the building. And I was like, "Dude, you're you're killing me. You're absolutely killing me." Yeah. And then little things, as much as Matthew Raywalt was Aiden English, uh, W. Morrissey and, was Big Cass. And it's like, like those like, names are so much more easy to say. It's just, big, I mean, there's a reason. I mean, Phillips is easier to say than Hannah Fan. Right. It's, it's a thing. So you, do you do you do you have a method? Do you sit there and repeat names? over and over again to yourself or do you just kind of just kind of went just kind of just, just went just, just trust yourself just went and did it and then it was like all right, the the biggest thing i always say to anybody that's thinking about doing wrestling commentary is and it's so simple but it's very difficult if you don't know don't say anything yes it, it, you know say something else so it's like oh his opponent if you can't remember his name in a second and just kind of pivot for a second and i would buy time for myself or i would pitch to delo and Delo's very, very good. Mm -hmm. I don't think he gets enough flowers, but he was very, very good, and he helped me a lot. Um, so just being able to take my time with it, and to your point, I wanted to come in there and make it seem like, hey, I was prepared, and I did my homework, but at the same time, it was a gigantic pressure of, okay, it's it's not the, the WWE style. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit more of a hardcore audience in mm -hmm. terms of they want to hear more moves, they want to hear specifics, they may want to hear about other promotions, et cetera. I needed to do my homework. I needed to be prepared. So it was just like, okay, if I didn't know, I didn't say anything. And it was just trying to navigate that. How much, how aware were you of the outside wrestling world while you were in WWE? I mean, I would imagine. Pretty with, pretty aware. You were. Yeah. I mean, with the amount of content that you have to absorb just for WWE, the idea that then you'd also go home and watch other promote, like it's a lot. It was a lot, and I was consistently watching. Um, occasionally, I watch Impact. I would watch um, Ring of Honor every once in a while. I would watch the occasional New Japan match, and um, I'd never really got to when AEW came to power. Didn't get to watch them just because um, I was working NXT, so it was right, obviously going up against. Yeah. And I'm not going to fly home and then watch a two hour show. It was just like, all right, this is a lot. So I'm watching six weekly products of WWE, plus uh, like NWA as well, which was how Power, yeah. Stu Bennett gets himself an opportunity on NWA. And then it's like, oh, goodness, wouldn't it be great if Wade Barrett was on NXT? Yeah. Boom. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I see what you did there. You're proud of yourself? Yeah. <laughs> so that was part of, you mentioned I had an opportunity to be a manager. Well, part of that was recruiting. So if I don't bother to go out there and watch other guys doing stuff, you know, Vic Joseph. He right. was working House of Hardcore and was connected with uh, Rhino and Tommy Dreamer and a number of people. You just know the right people and you get tape here and there. So I was watching a ton of wrestling tape when I was in WWE. Wow. Wow. And just keeping an ear out to who's out there. Yeah, it's just a matter of like who's the right fit at the right time. What's yes. the need that we might have that, oh, okay, that backstage interviewer or that ring announcer might be a good fit or we have a need for that at the moment. Timing is a weird thing too, right? Because people get very impatient and want their opportunities when they want their opportunities. Yeah. I want my opportunities when I want my opportunities. But like there are times when you have to trust the process and realize that if you get the thing that you want and it's not the right time for the thing that you want, it's not going to stick. I mean mm – -hmm. I can only imagine, because I have a very difficult time. It's something that within the last, I don't know, maybe only a couple of years, I've really kind of tried to process and be like, okay, this is something I have to get better at. This is something I have to be okay about, which is getting an opportunity and then losing the opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that is a tough pill to swallow. You yeah. go, okay, mm -hmm. it's all good. Like 
let me like you have to tr- you can't just trust the process when it's good news, right? Yeah, and it's it, it's which difficult. I'm sure you went through because it's like okay, we're gonna try you here. All right, we're actually gonna take you out of here. Okay, you're gonna be on. You're right. not gonna be on wrong. You're gonna be on SmackDown. You're not gonna be on SmackDown. You're gonna go over here. We're gonna put this person in, and you're like, as much as you you kind of have to just keep. I would think doing the best that you can and not taking things personally in a thing that you probably feel very personal about. Yeah, and I won't sit here and be like, oh, I never took anything personally. Of course I did. Of course, like, you can't, how can you not? We're all on-camera performers. We all have egos. So it's like, yeah, that there were instances where, yes, that but absolutely happened. That's also the other, that's the dark side of talking for a living. Yes. That, like we, <laughs> My talking's the best talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone can do it. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, how do I prove I'm better at talking than this guy? Right, what? right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just... I don't know. There were definitely instances where, again, maturity, starting at 23, getting to be 32 years old and just maturing as I was in the company, getting opportunities to uh, succeed and fail and Mm -hmm. having forgiveness and more opportunities to grow. That happened all the time for me in WWE. So, yeah, were there instances where I was you know, ticked off about something? Absolutely. But looking back on it in its entirety, what do I have to complain about? Yes. Like, I know plenty of people would love to come on a show like this and complain. I was like, no, seriously, I got paid a ton of money to travel the world and perform in what I believe is one of the best forms of entertainment available on the planet. What is the downside to that? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) And it set me up to do all the things I'm doing now. Like, look, even if you'd only done one episode, if you had done commentary on one episode of Monday Night Raw, Mm -hmm. you did commentary on Monday Night Raw. Well, that's it, it. It was... It was huge for me when I did first get an opportunity to do Raw because, and maybe this is a weird way to put it, but I always thought of saying welcome to Monday Night Raw as having similar gravity to Live from New York, this is Saturday night. I get it. Two very different shows, and I understand the audiences are very, very different, but that phrase is immortal in mm-hmm. entertainment. So to hear that go from vince gorilla jr cole and many others and then myself i was like wow i get to say this you said it every monday night i get to sit in this chair and have people's attention and just try not to screw up (laughs) right right and and that's 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 the part too yeah um what was it like uh uh during the pandemic like especially like at the beginning like when you're calling wrestlemania to work with idiots like you you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You get, i'm kidding you, you get awesome. roped into having to do nonsense no but like wrestlemania for example when it's like the technology hadn't quite been figured out yet thunderdome hadn't quite been figured out uh-huh. yet and it was literally you're in an empty performance center and you mm-hmm. can literally hear your commentary echoing off the walls as it's going into the microphone yep what was that like for you? Weird. Yeah. Really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, like you mentioned, like soundtracks where I wasn't really like happy with it. Edge and Randy Orton at WrestleMania. Wasn't thrilled with my call, and nor was the internet. So I'll take full responsibility for that. But it was like, all right, this is an empty building. And it's like you're trying to lay out so you hear the guys talking and saying all the things and all the points of contact and they're bashing into things. So like it's just like a guessing game at first. And then you slowly get used to it and you understand you've got to ramp things up. And then I remember fast forward to when the Thunderdome happened and there was a Raw Legends night. Mm -hmm. I think it was a WWE title match, probably Drew defending against, I don't know who. So you've got like Jeff Jarrett and a slew of other people up on the ramp. So they're maybe, what, 50 yards from where our desk is or something, less than that. So we're calling the match. No one's in the Thunderdome at this point. It's just the giant screens and all that stuff and the camera guys. So we get done and we get back into the locker room and Jeff is really nice and he was like, it sounded like you guys were calling a match that was in front of a sold out crowd at some 15,000 seat arena. And it was like, because we had done that already for six months with little to no crowd inside the performance center. So that muscle was there. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter to us that no one was really out there or anything. You have pumped in crowd into your ears. So it just kind of gets you lost in the moment. And isn't that what freaking wrestling is all about? Yeah. To just get lost in the moment, believe that it's all happening for real in front of your eyes for just a second. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. It was weird. Don't get me wrong. It was really weird taping all that stuff for weeks and weeks and weeks. And again, you talked about just the the overall fear of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We were like, how long is this going to last? How long are we going to do this for? Like, is this, are we good? You know, when are we going to go back to live? When are we going to go back to touring? Every single week, it was just questions, questions, questions. And it was just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, especially because like they didn't really, 
announce anything about that WrestleMania until like a week before. It was like, are we going to be yeah. able to get in the stadium, stadium, stadium? No. Well, stadium. I, and also realizing like we we shot all these matches and then it was like, well, what's the card? And we're like, we think it's X. Mm. But the, and it was like never in the history of WrestleMania was it like, oh, we could move the card as the show is happening or something like that. So obviously, it's a live show. So being able right. for them to go and figure out what they wanted WrestleMania to be on the cutting room floor. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So and by virtue of that, I called night two of uh, the night two main event. And I was like, awesome. Great. Thank Drew you. Versus Brock, right. <laughs> right. Which yeah. was so special to me and special for those guys, uh, more importantly. But it was like, oh, cool. Like by proxy of that. I have that on my resume. I was like, great. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. I called the WrestleMania main. Yeah. Yeah. Technically. The yeah. main event of that WrestleMania. Yeah. No, it works. It 100% counts. Yeah. Um, do you have a pressure on you at that point where it's like, man, I'm so happy for Drew. I'm so happy he's getting this opportunity. I got to help try to make this work for him. He should have that's, like a. That's anything. Yeah. That's anything. It does. With Kofi, when he wins yeah. uh, the WWE title in, in Kofi Mania. Yeah. Is that okay? Kofi Mania is probably a better example because I know you've said that that's like your favorite thing that you did I love just because. Is that a scary thing to, I mean, because you know the gravity mm -hmm. already, R regardless of you, you know the gravity of the moment, and now it's your responsibility to translate the gravity of the moment. Is that a scary thing, or are you feeling it so much that you're like, this is where I just allow the enthusiasm to tell the story? It's a combination. Yeah. I think that's for every commentator. You do get into a point where it's just kind of, you're just going and you're able to separate it, but how many times has Cole said how deeply he cares for John Cena? They're legitimately friends off camera. So it was very difficult for him to separate himself from what he was doing on screen and, and jr with austin and there's plenty of other examples like that so you just get caught up in moments like that naturally but yeah every just about every match that i felt i was like okay even if it's a normal match on a monday night raw or a smackdown or something like that you still want to do it justice you still want to be accurate yes and then with a pay-per-view it just gets magnified and it's not even just what's the story being executed it's the personal journey for everybody involved it, AJ and Shane from that WrestleMania yeah. in Orlando. That was a big deal for AJ. It was big for Shane. The, they have both had very different personal motivations going into the match, storyline motivations going into the match. So I felt a lot of pressure on that because it was my first WrestleMania, and I was like, oh, yeah, right out of the gates, I think outside of the, the Cruiserweight match on the kickoff show, I think the first match that I called was Shane AJ. And it was like, no pressure. It's wow. your first WrestleMania, and it's Shane McMahon and freaking AJ Styles. Like, have fun. That yeah. was that was Orlando. Yeah, yeah. That was your first WrestleMania you called. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I yeah that was that was that was my first WrestleMania pre-show. I think that was oh next year was Action. I know. <laughs> oh, I, thanks. Do I you remember. Do you remember when I did a Worlds Collide? I <laughs> absolutely. I, I loved it. Yeah, of course. Uh, Tom was one of the people who really, I mean, just enjoyed thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> my love at the New Orleans WrestleMania. I think it was 34. 34. Yeah, that sounds right. 34. Four. Yeah, 34 ish. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the many that wouldn't let me forget about that. Um, <laughs> and then it, worlds, that, it was Worlds Collide because that was one of those spots that I got booed out of the building. Mm -hmm. And then you walked past me, and my ear thing was still in as you got ready to call the match. And you immediately said actions on the way, and I went, "You son of a bitch!" Because I was calling whatever the kickoff show match was, yes, and it was what you, Andy, and Charlie. Charlie, I want to yeah. say, yeah. Um, and uh, all I could think about was, in the immortal words of Sam Roberts, <laughs> "It's time for action oh. for the World's Collide kickoff show." <laughs> and I wish I could have seen your face live. Uh, <laughs> I asked every director, cameraman possible. I was like, is there footage of this? I'm like, no, he'd walked off camera at that point. I was like, damn it. I heard it. <laughs> then why did I even say it? You know? It was very funny. It was uh, <laughs> unnecessary, but I, very it, funny. It was a low blow, and uh, yeah. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> you know, you were talking about, like, first of all, all right, let's talk about calls. I mean, you know what was mind-blowing to me? Hmm. Your first night at Impact. The sell out of the pay per view <laughs> is, and she's taking the title to the Royal Rumble match. Yep. <laughs> it's like, there's something familiar about this, yep. Tom. I was like, this is bizarre world that Tom Phillips, now Tom Hannafin, is going to be on an Impact pay per view <laughs> talking about Mickey James, who is the Impact Knockouts <laughs> World Champion, but she's going to be competing in a WWE match on pay per view. 
Anybody yeah. else confused? You know, I was like, <laughs> this was huge. It was like, seriously, it was really important to remember because they had an awesome match. Uh, Perrazzo and James had a yeah. killer Texas death match. It's great. And uh, it was like, yeah, you can't lose sight of the gravity of this because it's not just like, oh, okay, it's one entrant in a match. It's no, this is a big deal for not only Mickey James, it represents the Impact Knockouts World Championship on a huge platform. Mm -hmm. And then it's just representative of how Impact Wrestling does business. It's mm -hmm. literally yes. an open door policy. Open forbidden door, but it's open. Very open <laughs> forbidden door. Yeah. yeah. It's very forbidden and very open and open to anybody. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> yeah. it was like, okay. I was like, this is worth talking about because it's 2022 and just about anything can happen in wrestling. You and I, were, before we started this, talking about GCW. Yeah. Jeff Jarrett showing up. Matt Cardona is spitting beer in the fan, uh, the face of a fan, yep. which in a pandemic, it's like, interesting. Uh, but he would probably tell me to go F myself at this point, which is like, Matt Cardona would tell me that? Zack Ryder would say that? It's, Zack Ryder would not. Matt Cardona would. It, it's upside down right It is. Now. It's crazy. It's, but in, in the best possible way. I love it, man. Yeah. Isn't, because it, isn't it, that wrestling, though? That's the best. It's wrestling, and it also opens everything up to all the possibilities. And uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, learning things and maturing and forgiveness and this and that. And it really, I mean, it really is a valuable lesson. In wrestling, just like every other industry, that nobody leaves the business, right? Like, you see the same people, and it's like, Oh, I pissed that guy off, but don't worry. We're in different companies now. Oh, you'll see him again. Dude, Josh Matthews did my audition. That's what I'm saying. I didn't piss him off to my knowledge, but um, he's now my producer. It's wild, because I, I think one of the first, probably the first time I met you, mm -hmm. I was... Your audition. Auditioning, yeah. Didn't get that one. I but think, I was... I think I'm your bad luck charm. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were just floating around going, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. You got Arda a job, you can get me that's one. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I think I'm just bad news for you. I think that's right. I think yeah. that, yeah, you're your entire cloud. empire that you've built is going to get taken down off this episode. I shouldn't have invited you over. That was a terrible this idea. This is a bad idea. It was a terrible idea. But I do find, I love that. You know, I love Josh. And, uh, but that was that, yeah, that was the first time that I met you. It was right after you had gotten hired and Josh had done your audition and like get you. And then, when Josh was uh, out at WWE, came over to Impact, started a whole new second wave of his career, yeah. became known as the voice of that company. And now it's like, not only are you doing that, but you're working with Josh Matthews again. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's really, really cool. Um, and you mentioned uh, like uh, Renee at 2012, we started working with her in 2012 as well. And fast forward, you know, 11 years or whatever the hell it is, nine years. Um, I can't do math. But she's the one breaking the news about me going to Impact. And it's just like, okay, like these relationships are important, whether they be personal or professional. And that's the thing that as I've now been on the other side of things with WWE, it's just being grateful for all the different interactions that I had. Yeah. And I met so many people that I didn't even realize that one day it's like, oh, this might turn into something in terms of just a positive uh, business relationship or just a really positive friendship, yeah, period. Just a personal relationship. Sometimes that's in, like, it doesn't have to go like, well, where's it going to lead to? Yeah. Just two people that enjoy each other. No, like, seriously, you know? I like, could sit down here and do this with you for hours and hours and hours because, like, I haven't seen you in a year and a half. I couldn't believe it. The right. Last time I'd actually physically uh, worked with you in any capacity, or not physically, but like, you would work takeover pay per view or kickoff shows, and then I would be producing it remotely. And every and once in a while, Stanford. I could talk into your ear yeah. and be like, hey, man, how you doing? And that was literally all the communication. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, man, it just, it just felt so distant. It's wild. Me. It's it wild. so sad. And I'll tell you, it didn't bother me that you chose Renee's podcast to break the news on. <laughs> what bothers me <laughs> is that you've been sitting here for what's it been? 45 minutes. It's been 45 minutes? And you haven't even come close to shedding a tear. Well, and I'm watching you blubber on these other podcasts. I got emotional. And I, well, I mean, that's fine. We'll make, but I'm, I want some of that. Come on. Come on, make me cry. I'm not in touch with my own emotions <laughs> enough to get that done. I don't know how to do that. And it seems so easy when you and Renee were doing it. Do you want me to try and like, make you cry with something else that's important to you? Okay, well, I wore <laughs> I wore these shoes for you. Oh, this is gonna make me cry. Show me yeah. what you wore. I wore oh these. Oh my god! Bring the microphone with me. So these are uh, let me lift my foot Look there. Look at that. These are the New Balance uh, Two Ways San Antonio that Dejounte Murray uh, put out there a while ago. I bought these off StockX at one point, and I was like, I gotta pick a good moment to bust these out for. And I was like, who better 
than my favorite sneakerhead. You undiest them for me. You're like I'm not a hundred percent sure what Today, that means, but I'll say yes. I did whatever. Wow, that, whatever that means. Yeah. Wow, mm-hmm. took them out of dead stock. Mm-hmm. Just to show. Thank me. you for well, explaining what that means. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate. That I was very, much. very excited. What do you have on? Uh, right now, oh, just some, uh, just some little black cement threes. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Just some little black cement threes. It's just of which you these have. Are, these are my house slippers. Of... <laughs> no big deal to me. You know, of which you have like I walk the dogs in these later. <laughs> two to three pairs of every shoe that you own. I got to. I mean, I remember when I first came here and you showed me. It's like, oh yeah, I just some, have some of these just to have, to have, and they're just in a box, mm-hmm. and they will never see the light of day mm-hmm. ever, ever, ever. Nope. But I have been going through. Uh, I've, I'm I'm a little bit healthier in the sense that when I buy, I sell, meaning that like the hobby funds itself. Oh, great. So, like, when I see something Smart. that's, like, outrageously expensive, it's like, I have children. <laughs> I can't <laughs> just sit here and go, like, college is not for everyone. Did you think that after the first child? That first child was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough money for a baby and shoes. That's no problem. You when s- there's a toddler and another baby, right? then it's like... All right, we can't be just dropping. No, just just. I like how you're saying bills. we. Like Jess is like, hey, this is a we decision on this. Yeah, I'm like Jess. We're buying too many sneakers. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, speaking of health, you actually started like working out a little bit. I saw you post this on social media, and I was like, did you walk into the place next to the Dunkin' Donuts or something? <laughs> like, what what are you doing? I do like to stroll. I do like to stroll with the Dunkin' Donuts first. Um, yeah, no, I've been. Uh, you know, I've been I've been lifting a little bit of weights for you a little look great. while. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. What yeah. what inspired you to to do that? Uh you know, as I've heard you talk about it on other shows, I know that you got yourself into into shape and and tried knocked some, knocked a bunch of weight off. Uh, I never I always thought I never realized that you had gotten heavier than you wanted to be. Oh my to god, the there there are pictures from like I don't know, like January of 2020, where I was like, that's. Fat Tom? It's all in the it's all in the face. That's the worst place. If you for did it. side by sides, you'd be like, oh, I see it now. Yeah, I remember uh, when I I had disguise lo- beard. <laughs> it was like late 2021, and I remember talking to Sarah Schreiber, uh, love her, and she was like, oh, I thought you were a runner, and that you just lost weight because you were like running oh. more. And I was like, I've never been a runner, but thank you for saying. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I started, I don't know, a few years, a couple of years ago. Uh, Lifting weights. I don't do any cardio. Okay. But I do lift weights. And it's great. I love it. You're just really into wrestling culture that it's like, I'm going to lift, but no cardio. Well, like, if I'm going to sit here and exercise, I'm going to do stuff that the old man's going to be impressed by. Yeah. You know what I mean? Isn't that the point? To go to Titan Towers and use the gym, you know? Yeah. What am I going to do? Is sit there and impress, like, the big wigs at WWE and be like, guess how fast I can run? (laughs) They're like, guess how little we care. <laughs> Sam runs a four three forty. Can you believe it? They're like, I don't know what what you're talking about right now. No, I need to de- deadlifting and and all that. Yeah. Have you ever used the the gym at Titan Tower? No. I me neither. I've, no, I have not. I've never stepped foot in it. I have not. I think they'd throw me out if I did. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's the other thing too. Like you know, you gotta. I also do realize that there. Who knows? Maybe at some point, like when I did the show for the WWE Network, mm-hmm. not Sam Wrestling. Then mm. they were like, "You can produce your own show." It was in the middle of the pandemic, so it was like, you know, they were looking for content. I have a studio. They let me produce my own show. Right. It was like, what if the world's strongest man was coaching me on deadlifting? I love that segment. I want to see that. Yeah, I love I that. I want to see that very much. And there yeah. was, and we put it. It's on Peacock, and we pushed it. To, <laughs> we did push it to the limit at that point, but I've. I've I've passed it. I couldn't get three fifteen up at that point. That's a lot of that's a lot of pounds. It's a lot of weight. Yeah, I got three thirty five up now. But you know, I mean, it's not that's about great. me. We're not gonna, it's not about me. Yeah, I got three thirty five up. But we're not talking about that. Right now. Oh god. You know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not about. It's not about the weights. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, speaking of uh, enthusiasm, like mm. I, I feel like great transition. I feel. Thank you. I feel like somebody that. Uh, the internet and the and and wrestling fans in general don't quite have a proper uh, knowledge of is Michael Cole mm. and or appreciation of is Michael Cole and they shouldn't know what he does behind the scenes because that's behind the scenes like why would yeah. they? But when you were talking about like enthusiasm for calls, mm-hmm. did it blow your mind watching this guy, especially knowing him? And realizing he's been on the air for 25 years and he's still able to somehow find this like 
enthusiasm that sounds real mm -hmm. for the stuff that he's calling. It's really cool. The the vantage point that I had for a lot of pay-per-views because we would switch in and out uh, off the desk. You have the Raw team, the SmackDown team. So there was, uh, especially in the Thunderdome, since there were no fans, we could just kind of comfortably sit outside of the bowl. So I kind of had this oh, wow. view directly at the announcer's table so I could see Cole and Graves uh, at the time were on SmackDown. And to see Cole physically be into it, that's the one dead giveaway of somebody who's maybe not feeling it necessarily mm -hmm. at the desk or whatever they're doing if they're not like, I'm not saying you need to be like thrashing around or anything like that, but he is physically into it. You can see how much he is invested in what's happening. So yes, the guy off camera is very different. And then you get the guy on camera, and I said it before, he never misses when it comes to emotion. And people can knock him for whatever they want. And I'm like, y you think you know, you have no idea. Yeah, you're out of your mind. Yeah. You're out of your mind. Is he the person that was like, I don't know if mentor's the right, maybe mentor's the mentor. right word since you started at such yeah. a young age. I'd say that. I, maybe that, is he, is that, yeah. who, oh, who was the guy? 100%, because there were a lot of things just personally that I would go to him about and be like, hey, you know, how do I handle this within a corporate structure? Yeah. And he would guide me in the right direction on so many different things. So, um, yeah, I would definitely consider him a, a mentor in that respect. That last WrestleMania you missed because you because you popped for COVID, right? Yeah, the night before. Oh, was that like heartbreaking? That sucked. Yeah. Because then I thanks God didn't realize you hated me too. <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, it was uh, the right precaution at the moment, and I mean, of course, yeah, yeah of, oh, course. of course. Um, of, there's but... nothing you could do, but I mean, just the the timing sucks. Awful. And that happened to a lot of people, not just not WrestleMania, but like different pay-per-views and such, where it was like last minute and be like, so and so in a major match I mean, can't go. It's I still can't. happening. Day one, Roman Roman wasn't able to be in the main event of day one. If like, you say a, so that that happened, then it's, it's, yes. It I have, wild. <laughs> I'm, I'm paying this much attention. Well, you got a whole other job. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I'm loyal to somebody else. Yeah. Now. But uh no, it, it was it was terrible because uh Obviously, we saw where things went with the Raw team. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll get this chance to finish things strong with Byron and Joe, who I love and respect and really enjoyed working with. And that's just not what happened. So, um, yeah, that that really sucked. Were you like, yo, can I just maybe get, like, one more Raw since I missed WrestleMania? <laughs> like, could you not? If I'm in a bubble, how do we yeah. feel about this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I, like, do WrestleMania from my house? And they're like, we're not doing that. I, I was like, technically, the year before, I sort of did. Like for like pickup lines and pick stuff up like lines that? and then the what was it the kickoff show match for WrestleMania uh, oh god the, the one that was in the PC WrestleMania PC is what they call it. <laughs> WrestleMania yeah. PC um, I think it was Liv Morgan versus Natalia mm -hmm. I called that solo but I called it in my house wow because they you they call that solo from your house I mean you know what that really says everything they could have called me they didn't mm -mm. <laughs> they're like you know he really did not do well with phillips he does not compliment mm, no. phillips <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's like oh okay um no when that came up i was like all right my my health and my safety comes first and, and same thing with everybody else around me so i mean yeah easy you'd be a horrible human being horrible <laughs> i mean yeah yeah horrible human being yeah it sucks yeah there's no getting around it it's just like damn and so how long was it between the release and uh, the switch on Raw? So that was April 1st. Uh, well, a no, let me see. April 1st, I was informed about it. and then About the switch? About the switch. Did you kind of know? that there might I, had be a, I had a hunch it was yeah. coming. Um, and then the mania happened that coming weekend. And then I was released the last week of May. So, Got it. So about two months. About, yeah. And, like, when the Raw thing happens, are they like, look, it's not about you, it's not about blah, 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 or was it like, yeah, you need to work on this, you need to work on that? Um, more of the former. I would say that it was just, like, they're bringing in Adnan Verk, who yeah. is somebody I'd seen on ESPN and MLB Network, NHL Network for years. A name. So I have a ton of respect for Adnan, and I still do. And I was like, okay, like... And you've been through that rigmarole yeah, before you get it. it was, like other people have also experienced the same thing. I think like it was literally a, like the fourth time it had happened. So I was right. like, okay. So, um, but I did take that as a point of like, all right, well, I'm going to keep producing on NXT. I'm going to work 205 Live. And it's just, hey, what are some little things that I can maybe add to my game? How are things that I can try and break out of kind of what I'm doing now? And it's like leaving behind Tom Phillips and trying to be myself. Right. So I was tinkering with some of that stuff on 205 Live, which, you know, 
just didn't get a ton of time with, and obviously they went in a different direction. So it was yeah. like, all right, it's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Did you, was there anything that felt like, you know what, maybe my time here is coming to an end, or was it like, well, that. <laughs> that that was a big red, big red flag because they, uh, there had been releases at that point. So right. um, I'm pretty sure there had been. I can't remember the timeline exactly. But it was around. It was around that time. So I was like, okay, like this. This is possible. But even then, I was saying to myself, I'm like, no way. You know? But well, then, yeah. and then once everything happened, I was like, yeah, I can see exactly why this would happen. And many of the releases that have come up, um, some people in the outside world might not understand. But if you're on the inside and you understood the the office side of it, so to speak. It's like, yeah, you, you understand it. It sucks, but you understand it. It's also going to be difficult for you because of how you started and the fact that this is, at that time, all you knew of your adult life. Seriously. Like, you're like, what does being an adult with a job look like if I'm not in right. WWE? You think right? I, this guy can't hack it in corporate America. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, it was, it was really, yeah, it was really weird. It was really emotional. It was just kind of like, not having to uh, travel somewhere the next week was so weird. It was like, oh, you can, like, you don't have to have a suitcase packed all the time and you don't have to be checking your work phone and checking your email and stuff like that all the time. It was just, okay, it's a different pursuit now. It's about looking into other career opportunities that maybe I'd put on the shelf for a while. So it just kind of opened things up a little bit. But at first, or exploring those passions. Yeah, right? exploring yeah, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. And then, like, mid July was when the, the, Penn State football podcast started to materialize and I was like man this is a really cool thing and it just I don't know I think to a degree like emotionally I went through that phase of like maybe I'm not that good yeah I and mean how do you not go through that I think a lot of performers would think that way and I was just like um you know maybe I have a lot of things I got to fix you know and even those low moments where you're like maybe just I'm in the wrong space or I'm in the wrong field um and I think if just you, work through it if you don't take a minute and blame yourself like ultimately you can't you don't you don't blame yourself because right. it's not that's not true but if you don't take a minute and go like maybe i do need to get better you know i i think that that's i think that that's a healthy space to be like for us at the very beginning for a second to be just in that like low place and be like maybe i do need to get better because generally good things hopefully come out of that yeah and when you get past it it's like oh i'm improved for for that yeah you know, yeah. and, and and you hopefully come out of that space with a confidence mm -hmm. that makes it so you don't fall back into it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I've uh, talked about it before in terms of mental health. And I encourage people who, you know, if you have a stigma about therapy, you really got to rethink it, because honestly, it's been fantastic for me. But just kind of working through, OK, what what do I believe in myself? And like, I, I know what I'm capable of doing. I know what my ability is in terms of on the mic and all that stuff. But now it's like. Well, what do you want to be and where do you want to apply your skills? And I remember when I first started doing my podcast, I was like, well, I'm a reporter now. And I was like, you've never been a reporter. You spent <laughs> you spent nine years pretending to be a reporter because you to, are you a journalist? I have a journalism degree on my wall. But okay. I, I mean, you know, I have a sociology degree. It doesn't right. mean that I can exactly write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like while I have this, you know, degree, I was like, I spent my entire time in WWE being more of a narrator and an actor and a host and a you know a salesman in terms of pitching different things 100 all these different skills that are really valuable but i was like i was doing different shows where i was like oh i've got to get the facts right and i'm going to be about information i was like no you spent nine years being in entertainment and having a viewpoint and trying to be engaging and amusing and such and i was like okay like that's okay that's that's an okay route to go and it's just been trying to again i've mentioned it a number of times here but it's like what does tom hannafin want to do and what is that product on the air of Tom Hannafin, regardless of what space I'm working in. Uh, I'm working on that every day. I also think that there's a really weird uh, transition that people who kind of are in that independent space that you are now find yourself in have to go through, which is you're not going to get, there's no big person to give you their approval. Mm. Like you have to kind of, be okay with knowing whether or not you did a good or a bad job and kind of moving on from that. Like I'm, I'm sure at impact there are people that will tell you or whatever, but like when you, when you work for any company, generally there's somebody going like, like, you know, if you're doing a good or a bad job mm -hmm. because things are happening or your boss tells you or whatever it is, when you don't really have a boss anymore, right. You kind of have to figure all that out on your own, right? Yeah, and uh, like I have bosses at Impact. Sure, I'll but check in with them. But you know, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because that's that. 
impact is not your full-time career. It's the, one of the things that you're doing, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, yeah, like I'm my, I've always been my own worst critic. Always. Yeah, I get that. Uh, Graves and I would, and you were there in Pittsburgh one time, and you DD'd for us, which was great. But like, we would sit around after shows, and I would beat myself up. I do that about everything in my life. I've always been that way. Yeah. So, and he was always great to me, and just be like, dude, it's done. Like, it's just leave it in the past and move on. So, uh, I'm grateful that I have people like that in my life to reassure me of that. But at the same time, I was like, I've got to just lighten up a little bit. And I have plenty of things that I'm doing right now where I'm like, ah, I like that. I didn't like that. This could be better. And it's just like, all right, you just try and move on to the next thing. I feel like that, because I totally get it. I feel like the impact thing should be the thing that kind of shakes you to go like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good at this. Like, you know what I mean? And that like, because that's where it becomes undeniable to an extent. I wanted to see if it was going to be comfortable and it has been so far. Yeah. It's been really, really great. And honestly, like watching the shows, just even getting ready for hard to kill. And then what we just did this past week in Fort Lauderdale, I'm like, I don't know why people aren't watching this show. If if you're the wrestling fan who's just got a stigma about impact because some of the their rocky roads there in the late two thousands and early two thousand tens, dude, get your head out of the ground. No, it was a great show. This is a very good wrestling show. Yeah. If you want honestly, for me to compare it to anything, because I lived it, is these those early days of Triple H's vision for NXT. Mm-hmm. Is that it felt the same way and it felt like you could see those guys that were on the rise and you knew those long time developed stars that were really there to isolate things. It's a nice combination. And it's just, I don't know, it's just reinvigorated my passion for something that for a minute I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have this in my life anymore. I don't know initially if I wanted it to be there. And then slowly over time, like, yeah, this is something I love because, and you know this just from being a fan, in, in the course of a show, you experience every emotion, whether that's being a fan or as a broadcaster. Mm-hmm. There's nothing else that I've done I've done play-by-play for more sports than I can imagine. They don't compare to doing a wrestling broadcast because I did a show in Fort Lauderdale where I'm laughing one segment, and then I'm like, I can't believe he did this to so-and-so in this segment. And it's just, you do everything. Yes, You're telling stories. That's what wrestling is. It's storytelling. And it's like, that's, there's, it's the funnest. Storytelling is the best. Yeah. What could be better? I know. (laughs) I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you a funny story that I don't, I don't know that I've ever shared it with you, but I always remember it. Cause they're like, there are a couple of key moments where somebody said something to me that made me go like, oh, like I didn't know I was perceived as, as that way. Or I didn't know anybody knew who I was or anything like that. So like there was like the first one and I've told this story many times, but like when I first started interviewing wrestlers, it was because one of the WWE uh, PR people asked if I was going to the WrestleMania press conference mm. is when I was working in radio. And I was like, no, it's not open to the public. And they were like, right. It's open to the media. And I'm like, right. And they're like, you're in the... And you're like, what? Yeah, I swear to God. Like, it was the dumbest <laughs> thing. Like, I was like, it never even occurred to me. Yeah. That's what the word press is. Like, you, that would apply to you. And I'm like, you could sneak me in. And they're like, we don't have to sneak you in, Sam. <laughs> It's for you. <laughs> you get you a pass. You can use the bathroom and everything. You yeah, know? you can talk to, you can interview. I can interview them? Yeah, that's who mm-hmm. interviews them. Yeah. Fans? No, Sam. Mm-hmm. Media people. And so there was that. But the uh, one, another time something like that happened was it was one of the Hall of Fame ceremonies. Maybe it was WrestleMania 30 in New Orleans. You were there. Okay. For sure. Might have been WrestleMania 30 in New Orleans. Because that was one of the early ones that, like, I went there. I wasn't working with the WWE at all. But by then, I knew enough people that I was around, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I was there with Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. Maria Menounos was hosting the Mm -hmm. pre-show to the Hall of Fame or whatever. But I didn't have a pass. I just went with them. Right. So there was a a moment where I was backstage, and I was trying to get to the room that they were in. But I didn't have a pass. And then the guy stopped me and he was like, I can't let you through without a pass. I can't let you through without a pass. And you were there and you were like, oh, and you pulled out your thing. You're like, he's with me and like got me through. And you said this. I wouldn't have thought that like I would have to get you back there. And you said it like that. And I'm like, like in my head, like I played it cool because I was like, I don't oh, remember this. This was 100% happened because I, I remember playing it cool and going like, 
oh yeah i'm like a big deal but it's okay it's cool <laughs> but in my in my head i was like bro you're tom phillips <laughs> like i was you... nobody i've been with a company a year i know but point. i was such like dude i don't uh, wow I, I, this is that's the level of wrestling fan that i am and was like i was like no dude you're Tom Phillips. This like, is that's... just because I cried on Renee's podcast. You're trying to get me to cry here. Happy tears. She made you cry sad tears. Mine are better. Oh my god. Yes, and I, that's but that's what was in my head. I'm like, I don't know if you wow. know this, but I'm just some dopey fan that has tricked people into thinking that I work for the media, even though I do, I guess, work for the media. Right. You're Tom Phillips, bro. You're the man here, <laughs> not me. And it's been amazing to see you have all the success considering your significant physical advantages that you have and you've just yeah. jettisoned into handsomeness in a way that I was like, you know what? This guy deserves to be on TV. That's it. That's it. He That's sounds it. amazing. He looks amazing. I'm like, I have no shot. <laughs> I'm really screwed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Cole asked me, why did I shave my head? It was a great decision. That's why I wanted to be like, Cole, have you seen me before <laughs> I shave my head? Like, Really? <laughs> like, is that a real question? Aesthetics. I think it looks great. Thank I remember you. when you did it, and first of all, I was like, oh, he's, he really loves Hunter. So <laughs> he's just, <laughs> it was the exact duplicate of Hunter. I was like, cool, man. Uh, but no, it looks really good. I think this is a good choice. Yeah, that's right. Right afterwards, when I was down at NXT, I was like, Hunter, uh, yeah. looking good, what, Hunter. Did Sean shave his head shortly thereafter? Yeah. Sean shaved his head in, when they were in uh, Saudi. For right. that match and then let it grow back in. Right. But they did make an action figure of Bald Sean from the Saudi paper because that's the match he came back right, for. Right. And I swear to God, <laughs> if you were just like, <laughs> they made a Sam Roberts action figure, <laughs> it's like, so even like the box right. with the face on it, you're like, oh, cool. Sam got it. Oh, wait, that's not. <laughs> yeah. Sam Michaels. Wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget interviewing him when um, he shaved his, his long hair. Or he got a haircut to get rid of the long hair. Mm -hmm. I forget which WrestleMania it was at, but like, um, it was headline news across the internet. Like outlets were picking up. Shawn Michaels cuts his hair, and it's like you're somebody from your childhood changing their look. It's a big it's deal. It's a big deal. So I remember interviewing him, and I was like, dude, like I, I couldn't believe I was getting the chance to talk to him. And I was like, dude, I was like, so what happened? And it was something like his barber, it, like posted the photo of him without Sean's consent like he didn't want that to happen or he didn't quite get the haircut that he wanted mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there like discovering this whole story I'm just like oh this is some big stuff right now and Sean's legitimately kind of <laughs> mad about this <laughs> and I was like imagine having imagine having iconic hair and I would argue that your hair had a life of its own for it's, a period of time it was iconic it, it's a big deal to make that change yeah although I mean God helped <laughs> You know, I mean, let's not pretend God didn't get me halfway there. God. And I just finished the job for him. God help. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, Tom Phillips. Uh, hey. By the way. Hey, who is that? It's easier to say. Tom, oh, you jerk. And, uh, did you enjoy the Tom Spiracy when it was taking over the internet? Loved it. Tom Spiracy? I loved it, yeah. Just it like, went... I just loved the different height, depending on who he's with. It went on for years. Yeah. It went on for, and I was acutely aware of it, and I would always no-sell it on Twitter, be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, dude. No idea. Stand um, up straight every time. And I, I remember interviewing Kevin Hart one time, and he's like, you know, five foot, God knows what, and I'm just like, the microphone's here, and then other interviews where I'm just like, <laughs> up here, like celebrities, I was like, oh, they don't work here, I can no. do whatever I want. No. And What's then up, like, shrimp? interviewing uh, Neville Pack, I'm like, all right, I'm going to make him look an inch taller than I am. And yeah. Dolph and I would always screw around about that on the app. Are you ready to announce your height for the record? I am officially 5'11 and three quarters. We know now. But on Tom... my driver's license, I put six foot because I've got problems. <laughs> <laughs> six foot for the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> With anybody that's 5'11 is rounding up. Let's just be honest. Yeah. You no, know, especially like 5'11 and three quarters. It's like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost. 5'11 and three quarters sounds like you're lying. It yeah. sounds like you're 5'11. It's too precise. Just give round, me six foot. Just round just up. Just give me six foot. <laughs> you know, but in wrestling too, in WWE, it's like not good to be a six foot announcer. No, I know. I'm sure there have been conversations. He's perfect. He's six feet now. And then Vic's like six four or something. Vic's like a giant. That. Yeah, and he had to do the same stuff I did. Yeah, even worse. Bro, I seen some wild stuff. I don't want to call out anybody by name, but I saw somebody with their legs spread walking, and the shot was too wide. I saw it on TV. You mean me? Well, that happened to me a thousand times. <laughs> 
<laughs> Remember the Jericho interviews? <laughs> yeah. Jericho at one point ran circles around me, and you can see me doing a full split. And I'm like, and I told him, and all the camera guys were aware of it. Of course, like, I it's have to thing. do this. And yeah. I'm like, yeah. And after a while, it's just like, there's nothing you could do about that. You right. were where you had to be, and things happened. And it was like, okay, bro, this is just how I stand. Yeah. If you start do, are you gonna do you do the uh, meet and greet uh, circuit? I haven't been asked to yet. You should start doing the cons. I'll bet you do well at the cons. And when you do, photo op. <laughs> Tom doing a full Spiracy. split. Yes. Spread for the photo op. I think we'll start doing this. I mean, I think it's like special, and it's like a bonus, you know? Do I, okay, so do I charge extra? 100%. Because I've never done one. Well, think about it. When Sting's in gimmick, it costs more to take a picture with him. It's like, it's and, it's, and it's on the poster. It's like Sting is going to be doing a signing, and I'm like, eh, in gimmick. Ooh. Right. You know, he's got the paint on. Tom Hannafin's going to be here. Right. Okay. That's like, a normal standing picture. And then it's Tom Spiracy picture. Tom Spiracy. Is like 50 bucks. It would be special Tom Spiracy photo op. Exactly. $75. Right. It'd be like, yeah, you could do like 20 autographs. $800. For, I mean, but, 800 <laughs> is steep, but I mean, being it rare. <laughs> I, I think you got to get yourself on the, yeah, get yourself on the, on the, on the meet and greet circuit. I'll see what I can do. You know, make some scratch. I'll get that Tom Spiracy photo. I appreciate that. I'll yeah, I'll it. make you look tall. You I'll know? do it. Well, look, everybody, if you're not watching Impact already, watch Impact. Yeah. It's a great show. Uh, watch the pay-per-views. They're on fight. It's real easy for me. I, I love it. Uh, getting going on the fight app yep. and just getting everything. And also, you know what I love about the fight app? It all mm. stays on your app. Oh, well, that's lovely. You get your whole little, I have my whole little collection on my fight app. It's well, since great. You're, you're plugging fight, I'm going to plug Impact Plus because that Impact is also Plus, a very good deal. Impact Plus even better. And as someone who just came from the tapings that are going to lead into the No Surrender event, legitimately in an unbiased capacity, not just because they're writing me a paycheck, the No Surrender event, February 19th in New Orleans, is something that a wrestling fan is absolutely going to want to watch. That's fantastic. You're going to want to pay attention to it because there are matches that are going to take place there that I guarantee you you're going to be interested in it. Amazing. Amazing. Well, look, everybody sign up for Impact Plus. You can listen to the sweet Tom Hannafin pipes once more. Mm. You can see some of the best wrestling in the world. And I'm happy for you, man. Congrats Thanks, on man. everything. Thank and, you. And, uh, yeah, we'll do this again. I missed you. I missed you, too. Thanks for wearing those sneakers. <laughs>